as one of the activities of visiting professor program at the Ocean Engineering uh, Program. Uh, so my name is Entin Karyadi. I'm from the Ocean Engineering ITB, and I'll be moderating this seminar. It is, maybe, it is my honor to introduce to you our three distinguished speakers. Well, the first one is our distinguished guest, Professor Nobuhisa Kobayashi from University of Delaware, USA. Welcome to Indonesia, Prof. Nobu. Welcome to ITB. Nobu, are you with me? Okay, welcome to Indonesia. Welcome to ITB. And the, um, our second speaker is, we all know him, Dr. Andoyo Worianto, also from the Ocean Engineering ITB. And our third speaker is Dr. Muslim Muin, also from the Ocean Engineering uh, Program. So we apologize that Professor Ricky Tawakal cannot join us today. Um, so now for this seminar, we will have a talk. And after the speakers finished with the talk, then we will have a question and answer session. I think everybody follow that, right? No, Nobu, before we start, oh, Professor Nobu, I would like to read a short bio of Professor Nobu Kobayashi. You can find his full CV for that uh, over there, the HTTPS Coastal Udel Edu People Faculty. So it, you will find that it's more than 40 pages. So it's pretty hard to kind of, uh, make this uh, very short CV. So Professor Nobu uh, received his bachelor and master's degree from in civil engineering from Kyoto University, Japan. I think I would like to say hi to people or the participants in the online. So hi, forgot, sorry. So continuing. Um, and then uh, he continued to receive his PhD in 1979 in hydrodynamics and coastal engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. So that's uh, his PhD. After he received his PhD, he became a senior consulting engineer. And since ever since you are be, uh, being a consulting engineer until now, right, Nobu? So you're still doing consulting engineering. Okay, until now. So it's been like how many years? Since 79. Anybody can? count fast. <laughs> Maybe most of you haven't been born yet. So um, Professor Nobu received many, many honors and among them are the 20, uh, in 2014, he received the American Society of Civil Engineer Outstanding Reviewer for the Journal of Waterway, Port and Coastal Engineering, Coastal and Ocean Engineering. And in 2013, since he's also a professor, he got an honorary certificate for dedication to teaching and research in the field of coastal and port engineering. Okay. And he, well, he is the founding member of the Coast, Ocean, Port and River Institute, SCE, since 2000. Honorary member of the Coastal Education and Research Foundation since 2001. And of course, the member of American Society of Civil Engineers. He is also uh, uh, an editor of several journals, among others. Is, uh, he's uh, one of four editors in chief, Journal of Coastal and Offshore Science and Engineering since September 2021, and an associate editor of Journal of Coastal Research since 2000. So he's also an editor of books. One of the book is Coastal Structure in 2013. And he also written chapters in books. Uh, one of them is 
Handbook of Coastal and Ocean Engineering in 2009 and 2018. So he has published, this is very impressive, 150 refereed journal papers and more than 250 conference papers. So with his CV, long CV, I'm sure he could answer all of our questions about the coastal engineering. And I also know I'm happy to announce that he has become our adjunct professor. So he's an adjunct professor at our ocean engineering program. So that's pretty much it. And without further ado, Nobu, uh, you could um, give the presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you. How do I control that? Okay, I have a uh, three topics. And uh, I'm supposed to talk 45 minutes. Okay. I thought that you may like to see the what what is the coastal engineering. And uh, 2018, we Delaware organized the International Coastal Engineering Conference. 2018. So since we are organizer, I. We know the details, so I chose 2018. And this is a 36 conference every two years. So you can see that uh, coastal engineering is more or less started in 1950. And uh, within civil engineering, it's relatively new. And this is similar to the ocean engineering also started after the World War II, when the oil and gas is exploration was uh, going on in the Gulf of Mexico in the 1960s in North Sea. So it's a relatively new field within the engineering. and 102 technical sessions. So altogether 483 oral presentation, and each has 20 minutes, and 72 posters, even posters, have five minutes pre uh, presentation. So you can see that there's five, 555 presentation. So this conference, if you attend this conference, you can get all our picture of coastal engineering. So it's easier for you to decide what is the new, what is old. So typically you have to attend this kind of conference if you, if you want to do uh, new research. Oh, it doesn't change. So number of people registered, 763. And uh, people attended this conference. And usually number of people who attend is, is uh, largest from the country of organization. So this time, United States has 356. Japan had 100, 100 people and the Netherlands. So those top three is usually most presented. Okay, Netherlands is a small, less than Japan, but if you think about population of Delaware, uh, Netherlands is about 
more like uh, fifteen percent of Japan or twenty percent, then you can see per capita Netherlands has more coastal engineers, and then, then Korea started attending this conference around uh, 1990. Okay. And uh, hopefully Indonesia become like Korea that uh, you can see after Korea, China, then almost all of them are Europeans and Australians. Okay. And uh, so hopefully Indonesia will get more. This is a sequence of a conference. I, 1998, they started the first ones now around 1950. I, I'm showing you just a more recent one. So 1988, Malaga, Spain. This one was when Spain was progressing economically rapidly. And then they realized beach is important for tourism. And then they put, put uh, more emphasis on coastal engineering. And I really think Indonesia has a big potential for tourism. I think uh, Thailand got 40 million tourists uh, per year before pandemic. I think uh, Indonesia should be able to get more than 40 million. And uh, then Netherlands. So you can see Europe or Japan. And then finally, uh, 2010, we had a China. So finally, 2010, China and 2014, Seoul, and 2016, Turkey. And uh, 2016, Turkey, originally Istanbul, but uh, they had a failed military coup, so they had to postpone. And then 2018 is US, 2020 was canceled, but pandemic. And 2022 is Sydney. So I think uh, I should say future of coastal engineering is uh, probably in Asia because Asia economy and everything growing faster than other part of the world. So hopefully Indonesia will step in. Okay, this is a technical session. And you can see that uh, within the coastal engineering, you, we divided related waves and storm surge and tsunami. So you can see top two is related to mostly we are concerned about storm and the damage also including tsunami. But then sand moves, sediment moves, and the structure can be damaged. That's why you have sediment structure and the coastal zone management, all this uh, additional part. I'm not going through all that go through, but uh, this kind of uh, table is useful for you so you say, I want to work on this kind of topic, then this give you what kind of topics included, then this proceeding is ac ac accept. You can access this proceeding free online. Okay, so you say, so when you're doing master thesis, then I want to do this, then you go to this uh, conference, and then if it's 2018, it's listed like this. This one, this is the I listed like this, okay. If you go to actual proceeding, 
all the waves are is together. So it's not easy to find what you're looking for out of 500 papers. Okay, so this tends to give you some idea what's included. And this is what's included for storm surge and tsunami. And so you can see there are lots of lots of topic within each categories. And sediment is usually we worry about big erosion during a storm, but also long-term gradual erosion. So that's why, and then in order to predict the erosion or accretion, we have to know what causes sediment movement. So we have to understand the mechanism and uh, some, loc <coughs> some locations you have to work. Mud transport is also important. I think in Indonesia, if you build a port, you typically uh, worry about uh, sedimentation of mud in a navigation channel. And the coastal structure, there's lots of different coastal structures. So this has coastal, it's not coastal structure, wave, also tsunami, also even dikes. And the coastal zone management is essentially in order to manage the entire project, it's not enough to look into just wave, storm surge, sediment structure, but you have to consider society. So in addition, you need economics, environment, and uh, social factors or impact. This topic, <laughs> this topic is getting more important because now people demand more comprehensive approach. So it's not enough to, for engineers say, we do, we do this. They, they say, what is the impact of the project on the society and the people? So there, everyone has a different opinion. Question is how to manage different opinion. So that part requires not really engineering, more like social science. This is uh, one research topic. This comes from, uh, if you have cross shore sediment transport, sediment moving cross shore, and then if you have beach nourishment, then profile changes, or if you have too much sediment go over, profile may change. So this is, we did the experiment and we analyzed. Okay, so what happens is the uh, simplest model is so-called equilibrium profile, equilibrium profile. So if you average beach profile over the long term, you get certain beach profile. And this is convenient, but uh, it, it uh, misses lots of part. And if you start putting sand, then beach profile may become steeper. <coughs> to transport sand offshore. Overwash means you have a low beach, then sand goes over. Then maybe uh, the beach slope may become uh, gentler. So the motivation of this study is in America or in Delaware, some people complain that the beach nourishment make beach steeper and some people get injured. Then uh, the state of Delaware is responsible if somebody injured. So this one we looked into beach, if you do the beach nourishment, how much profile change. So nowadays, uh, 
since we are doing engineering, not science, topic comes from what actually happens in the, in the actual, from the actual project or actual situation, then to make it research, we, we make it more general. So that's why we also added a negative uh, increased slope or a decreased slope. So we did the laboratory experiment. This is the experimental setup. So we generate wave here. We have a significant wave <laughs> height is 17 centimeters. And we have 400 second run in the period 2.2 seconds. And uh, there's eight wave gauges, three current gauges. ADV acoustic dog curve velocimeter is about, uh, this is a point velocity measurement. It costs about $10,000. Then wave gauges is only $1,000. So this one has only three. Okay. But you can get only one point and the velocity varies vertically. So in terms of cost effectiveness, wave gauge is more important. Laser line scanner is also cost only $10,000. This is very convenient. So traditionally, how are you gonna measure the profile? And uh, and uh, you have a true and all, almost uh, two meter, okay? And then you have to, if you measure only one point like this, you need lots of lots of points. So this laser line scanner is motorized cut, means cut is moving slowly entire length. And then while it's mo moving, scanner go like this. And it's a laser. And you can get the entire, entire profile very quickly. And so if somebody doing Beach profile type experiments, you need a laser line scanner. And uh, this is uh, the reason I'm spending a little more time is if you're gonna invest your money, then laser line scanner is good. Wave, wave gauge is good. ADB, you want to measure velocity, but uh, at least only a few locations. And uh, we changed the water depth. So what happens, the equilibrium profile, and we put the sand on so that uh, you have uh, simulated beach nourishment and the simulated wave over topping and overwash by increasing water level so that water go over the, at the end of the tunnel, uh, end of the flume. So what happens in this case, wave go back and forth, and you create the equilibrium profile and, uh, and the no overtopping. Overtopping means water goes over so that the water sediment is going up. And this one is the negative here. You put the sand here. So it's a mini beach nourishment. And then sand will disappear fairly quickly. And the positive one is sand going over so that you are losing sand to the landward. So these, does these effect overwash or a beach nourishment? Does it affect profile? That's a question. And the traditionally we assume beach equilibrium beach profile is not affected by overwash or beach nourish. So we want to say it's gonna affect profile, then question how much? And that's a question we want to answer. Yeah. Okay, another way to put it is go like this. You work, you do something, 
and everybody assumes this, then you have to ask questions or maybe say curious, say how or why can we assume this? So even if people assume doing this for the last 20, uh, 30, 40 years, you have to ask, is it justifiable? So this is the uh, same idea. We try to quantify effects of beach nourishment. And this one, uh, this one shows how wave changed essentially. This one shows the wave height decreased after wave breaking. This one shows wave breaking create wave setup. So what happens, wave can increase the mean water level. And typically that's not negligible at the shore. About 10% of offshore wave height is wave setup. Then wave setup increase the water level, that's increase the flood. And then this is a wet probability means this one, this water is not all the, always aware, uh, exist. This is the velocity, key is under top velocity, offshore current, negative offshore. So if you generate a wave, you create offshore current. The reason is wave carries the water to the landward near the free surface, then water cannot go through the beach so it come back. This is uh, undertow current. This is the people, uh, surprisingly, we didn't know the under, undertow current until uh, 40 years ago. And then uh, the reason was velocity was very difficult to measure. And the ADB allowed us to measure more accurately. And this is eight centimeter per second. This is the wave induced oscillatory velocity is 20. So relative to wave velocity, wave oscillatory velocity, this is still small, but not negligible. And then people say, undertow current carry suspended sediment offshore. So people say this causes erosion. Then questions why beach is equilibrium. That means something else is causing onshore transfer. And our numerical model or our study shows we have bedrock near the, so this is, this is in the water column, so near the bottom, at the bottom we have bedrock, that's onshore. This is a profile change. So you can see that, uh, this is the initial profile, major two profile, then this is the equilibrium profile, nourishment profile. And uh, so you can see that change is relatively small. And then question, can we predict this is, if you have both sediment goes over, shoreline moves to the land. If you put the sand here, Sure, I move seaward. Then can we predict this? So then this is a small scale test. Not a laboratory scale. What does it mean for field scale, actual beach? That's a question we have to answer. And this is the amount of sediment. This is the amount of sediment went over. This is the amount of water went over. And then traditional analysis is assume the entire profile moves without changing, translate. And then you get this kind of equation. Yeah. And you can analyze it. Then this is the, this is a measure the over top and you calculate this. And then you can see any test beach nourishment is this. This is over topping, right? Then it's uh, initially it's the same, but 
after profile change, we couldn't maintain the overtopping rate. So what happens is positive. So this is a theoretical line. This is actual measured value. So what it means is, what it means is this the equation I showed you is in a textbook and it's used in the ma manuals. Then it's clearly under underestimate shoreline displacement. Okay, point here is lots of things in a textbook, manuals, it's not completely wrong, but you can see how unreliable they are. And if it's manual, they never say, they typically say, do this, do this, do this. They don't tell you too much about accuracy of formula you're using. And so you really have to be very careful, especially with the coastal engineering. Structural engineering, more reliable, the reason is structured man-made. You have control over uh, your structure. Sediment, beach, it's a natural phenomenon, so you don't have too much control over nature. So even do the experiment twice, sometimes you don't get exactly the same result. So we said, can we come up, uh, explain shoreline changes? Uh, and we did a simple analytical solution. And uh, anyway, we have a formula and the simplified, and then uh, we came up the equation to show that we can calculate shoreline displacement analytically. And then this is the equilibrium profile. So if you look at this, it tends to fit reasonably well. But if you start checking how much shoreline shifted, it's shifted. This is once you do the beach nourishment, shoreline shifted about 10 centimeters. So it's, it's not that, that big uh, shift. And then this is uh, major analyzed results, analytical results, not numerical. And we do the same thing for the, when water goes over, then it's also about one, 10 centimeters. And then comparison shows not as good. And then we want to know, can we use this to estimate what's gonna happen in the field situation? And, and then this is a closure depth, but if you look at this, uh, this is a typical uh, beach nourishment volume per year. Then even if you have very large nourishment, shoreline shift seabird less than one meter. So equilibrium beach profile is fairly good, except it may, sh it may shift seabird. And on the other hand, the landward movement is similar about one thing, uh, yeah, so, so this one is a sensitivity, but still also shift is one meter. And we compare to the numerical model. So this is a hydrodynamic comparison. Typically, our computer program simulates this within an area of about 20%. And the profile change is, uh, it's a diesel, but not uh, completely accurate. Uh, so we have some numerical problem here. Okay. So what happens is, conclusion is uh, the assumption of equivalent profile is reasonable. And the still shore I may shift one meter seaward or around one. And um, 
This one is maybe you may be more interested in. <coughs> this is development and sell to reduce show erosion and overtopping. So we did the three experiments, no structure, development, and sell. So this is a development. Okay. Development, this is built in all open ocean. So to protect shoreline, you put the stone like this to reduce erosion. The only problem of this is sometimes if the reason you are putting this structure is shoreline is eroding. So even if you built this, to protect the shoreline, erosion continues in front of structure. Okay. Another way to put it is stones protect sun only below the sun. Here, no protection. This is seal. You put slab in the mound, and then this one is called a living shoreline. Instead of this, and then it's, this is ecologically no good. So people suggested we put seal and do the planting vegetation, and then this has more ecological benefits. Okay, so this is a trend that uh, try to use nature as much as possible. On the other hand, if you do not build this, this may be destroyed by waves. That's the reason you're building this. So the, uh, Indonesia has a long coastline. So you have to figure out what's the best way to do coastal engineering work for different kind of beach for entire Indonesia. So I really think somebody in Indonesia has to map entire Indonesian coast using satellite data. We tend to, we nowadays we use Google Earth Polo, then you can get the entire coast and you can get, uh, you can get the photos. Uh, Sometimes if it's a popular destination, you can find the satellite photo or not. They are playing photo every, every year. And then you figure out what can you do, and then there's a the, the different option. Traditional, we just build a structure. Now, sometimes you try to use vegetation as much as possible. Only problem vegetation is even if you plant, it may die. So you need somebody who knows vegetation. And then you have to know what kind of vegetation grow for this kind of beach or a different location has a different vegetation. This is the same tank we did the experiments. And this one is sand only, no structure. So bomb in no protect. This is bomb. <coughs> and uh, we use stone to protect this bomb. And this is a seal. This is before we put vegetation. So question is, without vegetation, if you put a stone here and the reduced wave, this erosion you know, bomb is protected against waves. So this is a uh, three test we did. So we create a steep slope, so it's gonna be eroded, and there's a three different water level. So, so water level is increased. So same wave condition. And then you compare the three different structures. And then this is different sand characteristic, bluestone, greenstone. You can, see, you can see that this is slightly larger than this. 
because we are also concerned uh, does it move if the stone move or a stone doesn't move so that's the reason we have different stones then this is the comparison of hydrodynamics it's similar and the major three different cells and you can see that if you put the seal wave is smaller behind the seal because this shows this uh, tri red triangle is if you have put seal there before seal almost same there you have smaller wave uh, so surprisingly it doesn't change that much and then this is how much wave over topping of how much water goes over the bum. So without structure, water starts going over, even the, before water level goes up, this is black line, black circle. And if you have seal, no overtopping, then overtopping occurs, then development is no overtopping, then overtopping. So in terms of reducing wave overtopping, development is best. And this is how much sand go over. It's the same thing. Development is best. And then this is a major profile change for no structure case. So this particular case, we made it steep so that some sand sediment moved here and then eroded when we put the water level higher. This shows sediment can also move onshore. So in order to predict this kind of change, you need the suspended sediment transported offshore by undertow, and also you need a bed road moving sand onshore. So in this case, onshore transport. And then this one is development test. You can see change is very small. This one is after water level goes up here. And then once you come here, wave going over and create a little bit hole. So development can be damaged by water going over and create hole behind the development. Then Cyril's case, initially, this part didn't change that much, unlike no structure case. But once water level here, erosion occurred. So what happens is if structure submerged too much, it does not reduce wave and erosion cuts. So typically the case is a seal low crested level mount works only if water level is, is near the crest or a below. And then this is the damage of structure. And <coughs> we compare the uh, green and blue stone and also seal. So you can see this is a seal. So seal is damaged. And then this one is, this number is roughly number of stones moved. And then two means two stones moved. This is a development. Once water level goes up, it starts cutting more damage. Okay. So point here is that you have to worry about not only beach erosion, you have to worry about damage to your structure. And then this shows that uh, we had a filter below the stone. Okay. And then filter settled and the stone surface settled. This is the development. So even if you have filter and stone, sediment sand moves below the filter. That's the reason stone also settled. 
And this is not included the existing design. The existing design cannot predict the stone settlement partly because we cannot predict how much stone settle, filter settle. On the other hand, uh, the Sears case, low crest of the rubber man, filter didn't change. That means sand underneath didn't move, unlike here. But stone is damaged, so wave go over, then some stone goes here. Then wave coming back, some stone go here. So this one is stone damaged and the profile change. This one is mostly stone didn't move, but uh, filter settled. Uh, we try to use a numerical model to predict this, but we cannot, we cannot predict how much filter settles. And then we also checked how much sand deposited inside the structure. So you can have deposition of sand about uh, less than one, one centimeter. And the point here is existing method do not predict how much sand trapped inside the structure. The point here is lots of things we do is if we cannot do it, usually we don't include it. So that's, that's also goes back to the point I was making that surprisingly lots of things ignored in the present design or nothing written in the manual. So this is, uh, we did the experiment. And uh, so you can see development is more effective if you do not consider the ecological aspect. If you design seal for the sake of ecology and the vegetation planting, you have to worry about water level. So if water level become high, then seal is not effective in reducing the weight. And we did the numerical modeling. This is explained the numerical model, but uh, the under worked on numerical modeling for time time dependent model. This is simpler model, and the, the reason is uh, we had more complicated model or a computational intense model. Nobody use it for actual application. So we came up time average model so that we don't have to predict what happens within each wave. So this one's uh, what happens every, <coughs> uh, every monarch for actual application one now. So this is the damage prediction. And you can see that uh, major predicted. This one has, this is major, this is computed. So this is reasonable, but here, error is 100%, 100%. So you can see that uh, it's not easy to predict the damage to structure. Hydrodynamics similar can predict within error of uh, 20%. Wave over topping is very difficult to predict. This is major predict. This is 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two. So we can predict only order of magnitude of wave over topping. And then this is major the computed profile. It does a reasonably good job, but the detail is very difficult to predict. This is different profile. So you can see this is the state of art. And here, this one is filter location, and this one is the initial filter. And uh, final stone bottom. 
So you can see that uh, it's not easy to predict. Okay, so this is the conclusion of numerical model. Okay. 45 minutes, yeah? Yeah, about 45 minutes. Thank you so much, Mabel. Thank you so much. And now we are open for questions. Yes, we have a few questions from the audience. Audi is one of the history buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just one question for Pak Ahmad. You met him last night oh, yeah. at the dinner. Thank you, uh, Professor Kobayashi. Um, it's very interesting topic. Uh, the first question is um, how you, so I assume you're using fraud number similarities and it's in your experiments. So uh, how you uh, scale down your, your grain size first? Um, I don't know, in, in, in my mind, it's like the grain size is, is, is very important in terms of the changes of the uh, shape of the pro profiles. That's the first question. The second question, how important the cross-shot compared to the long shot? So in, 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 in our case, we have some, some projects using the beach nourishments. Um, in, in, in the equilibrium, usually um, longshore car, longshore process and then longshore transport is, is far more important. So compared to the longshore process, this is in what percentage the, 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 uh, uh, the occurrences of the changes of from the cross shore. Thank fast, you very much. Fast is uh, grain size. What happened is go like this. This we in an experiment we use the fine sand. Then if you scale up fine sand to the field, it may become coarse sand. So the, our strategy is we don't assume any scale. We use small scale experiment, and then we calibrate the numerical model just coefficient dimension. That's and then we use the same model to field condition. And we have shown the same model works for field case and the laboratory. As long as model has basic sediment dynamics, model should work for small scale, large scale, and field scale. Okay, so the, what happens is if you did sediment transport textbook, then they said, okay, all day people may uh, try to use sediment with a different density or whatever to simulate field condition. So we are saying none of them really work and they're not convenient. So our strategy come up, set a model just like Hydrodynamics, if you have a good, uh, accurate enough hydrodynamic model, it should work small scale, large scale, field scale. Same idea for sediment. We managed to achieve this model for the last 10 years. And uh, as far as a long shot, cross shot, if you do a uh, large area, traditional view is. Uh, Long short treatment transport is a determined shoreline change. And we've been trying to show that cross shore sediment transport is uh, someplace equally important. So, what you said is also that's what's written in the textbook. And the uh, shoreline change model does not include cross shore sediment transport. And uh, yesterday's seminar. We showed certain cases that cross shore sediment transport is more important. So, what I, I'm trying to say is that uh, if you go to the field and you measure a shoreline, and then you use one line model, and then if it doesn't fit, you change the coefficient and they try to get the agreement, and then typically it doesn't work all the time. So, all I'm trying to say is. 
that when it comes to the coastal engineering sediment, that whatever in the textbook is only half true. Half true. And usually I said those are not included in text. So they say this is the one line model, this is what you use. The yes. reason is error is typically 100% more. So you don't know whether 100% error comes from the way you analyze longshore sediment transport, which formula you use, or, or you could you didn't include the closure sediment transport. Another way to put it, we are researchers. We have to improve the state of art. And the state of art is this. Then I think, uh, so you cannot be this that if you believe everything in a textbook. <laughs> okay, Nobu, uh, Prof Nobu. Um, what we are learning from textbook or what I am teaching actually is that the cross shore transport is seasonal and the long shore transport is like no. more long term. So if no, no. we consider the change of the shoreline. You know, textbook we... says uh, so during a storm, Sediment goes offshore. After storm, sun come back slowly. That's true. So that's why. So another way to put it is that existing knowledge is limited, so that uh, so that uh, during a storm you want to say offshore wind, then we try to simulate. Then how you combine that kind of model to more like long term shoreline change. There's no model, so that's one of our goal. Our model is computationally easy, so we can simulate how profile changed over six years. So we are trying to do both together, so computationally we can do it 10 years. But the question is how accurate it is. So there, we haven't uh, proven uh, the, we haven't shown that the uh, work, we have to, it's, this is what they have to, you have to do. But uh, at least we are trying to change how we do it. So if I succeed, or maybe actually somebody in Indonesia, you may want to do it. But the only problem in Indonesia is you don't have a good web data. You don't have a good web Wave, wave data, if you, if you need a wave data 10 years. So if you're doing simulation in uh, Indonesia, you have you assume certain waves. And then do the uh, long shore sediment transport using SAC formula or another formula. That's already has a lot of waves or uncertainty. So lots of uncertainty come from model itself, but the uncertainty come from what, what kind of data you are using. All right, Nobu, maybe just a little question, Nobu. So how do you model in, in your modeling for the effect of the longshore then? If you because run for a long time, then there would be an yesterday effect. Yesterday, seminar, I talked uh, about uh, three kilometer, and uh, we have cross your line, and we include the longshore sediment transport. So numerical model can predict the longshore sediment transport, right. and we can have uh, uh, how much, loss of sediment you get wrong show. So yesterday the model actually had this. That's the first time we did a simulation over six years, distance of about uh, three kilometers. And the distance, cross show distance one kilometer in front of the structure. But the problem here, here is not, uh, you don't have really good data to, show model works. So if you're predicting a profile change, 10 kilometer, one kilometer over the six years, then first 2015, we had actual profile. But uh, 10 years later, there's no actual profile. So we tried to, we, first channel we wrote, you said, First general, we wrote said the same idea. Said, no, this cannot be true because uh, now everybody's wrong show sediment transport. Then I said that's not the case for this particular case. Then we didn't have a data for 
ten years later. There, we burden of proof is we have a writing paper, so we didn't. Have, so we went to another jar. They accepted because it's a new idea. So it's not completely proven. It's good to have this kind of discussion. And another way to it is uh, if you accept existing concept, no, no, no progress. You have to be Galileo sometimes. Yeah, Galileo is the one who said, Earth is circle. Yeah, at that time, people saw the Earth is, uh, oh, yeah. But the problem is, you have to prove yourself. Galileo actually did lots of measurements to prove that's the case. So that's part of science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just a quick follow up. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, I agree with you. The burden of proof is the one who makes the payment. <laughs> so I don't want to make more any claims here. So, yeah, um, but um, so since you say that about the, the time interval, and then the, I remember in, in your slide, it's 26 or uh, 37, and you show that uh, this, uh, you mentioned that your, your experiment is planned for 800 seconds, which means it's not almost three hours. How you compare that uh, 10,000 10, seconds? Which means, uh, yeah, yeah, the problem is uh, this is essentially one stone. Essentially, this one, let's say roughly, scale is one to 10. So, more, or one to 25, then uh, more like two, three hours may become one day or something like this. But, uh, the reason this is a laboratory. So, so you scale, scale the time as well? No, I, I said this is not in scale. Mm -hmm. Strategy, that's also all the concept. You do laboratory testing. Okay, the, the way to put it like this people try to simulate field condition in a laboratory, and nobody will succeed. The reason is sediment transport is too complex. So we gave up. We gave up completely. Then we have a numerical model to do everything. So model still needs calculation. So laboratory testing is a very controlled thing. You can measure flow, you can measure weight. So you can measure ev everything. Then if you, you can assess the accuracy, then you use that model to the field condition. Then field condition typically not enough that. So even the web data is uncertain, profile is uncertain. So there's a different uncertain time. Then question is, what is the error of that uncertain versus error of models? Then based on our experience, it's about 100 times. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, what was the so that is the the right, the right, the right, the right, the right, the the right, the right, the right, the right, the Use average, average. So, um, so this is what, what I said is contraindicated because uh, in terms of dissipation, for example, so you you the more the, the deeper your, your your water, your 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 is is should be spread along the along with the water column. Yes. Uh, this is the inside the soft. This is the inside the soft. So what happens is uh, if you do regular wave testing, 
Undertow current is maximum near the bottom. Undertow current is different from linear wave state. So you see the linear to the bottom near the ceiling. Yeah, near the ceiling. So it's the but, but that's a regular wave test. And then undertow's vertical profiles are highly uncertain. So we simply assume the undertow is, uh, we use average undertow current velocity and the amount of suspended sediment to go offshore. That's the way uh, the, we predict the uh, suspended sediment. Yeah. What, what does it mean? You cannot neglect, neglect the friction. Yeah. You cannot neglect the friction. The friction is included. Friction, friction, friction. But still, you still find that the deeper the gas, the higher. No, no, no. That, that's that's uh, you have too much concept from linear away from deep water into I mean, the shallow. No, that's not the. I, I understand your, your non linear. No, no. This is the problem. That one showed data is coming from inside the surface. Okay, maybe. Okay, let that be all right, thing. all right. Thank you, Ahmad. So maybe we can have a more discussion after after this talk. Uh, thank no, you. And it, let's go like this. If you have a wave propagating like this, no bound here, then then second or the steady current is largest near the sun. Then. If you have boundary here, water cannot go through. So it comes back. So that is undertow. So undertow current is dependent of band, lateral boundary condition. Right. So you cannot generalize uh, if you use a linear wave theory on the east horizon. In an infinite horizontal extent, it's different. All right, thank you, um, Ahmad. Thank you, Prof. Nobu. Maybe we should give a chance for the participant online if they have question. One question, quick question, probably. If there are any, you can show it. Oh, there is no question online. We had Pak Muslim. Uh, Pak Muslim has a question. Uh, Professor Nobo, I am Muslim Moyen. The, the tool that you develop, does it work for cohesive sediment or only for non cohesive sediment? Oh. Then do you think cohesive sediment, it, uh, it will be future topic? Because it's Seems to me it's very challenging. All right. Thank you. Okay. This is yeah, a, yeah. In in his no, no, that's this, right. That's right. This is a cohesion descent. Cohesion. Cohesion. No cohesion. So this is sand, not clay. Sand. So uh, the the yeah sand or gravel, not uh, not. Uh, Sand and gravel and stone. We have different model, or a, we have a sediment transport model for clay, clay or a mud. Mud. We also try to simulate uh, how mud flat profile changes. The mud flat prediction is more difficult. The reason is sediment or mud come from uh, far away and the deposited. So unless you know how much coming, it's hard to predict. This is a problem also, boundary condition. You don't know how much mud coming through and then settle. If the sediment going out only all the time, we can predict. So we, uh, we compare the model for more like one year profile change for particular location. And then that uh, certain time, so diva carries a um, sediment, mud, and then deposited. So if uh, discharge is large, 
more sediment is deposited. And the discharge law, sediment is eroded. And how it's eroded is fairly different. The entire profile goes up and down. Sand case eroded deposition. Well, you can see this is eroded right here. And then uh, mud case, entire profile goes up, go down, then it has to come somewhere. So it can be from offshore or our own show the rivers. That's a different topics, and uh, that's more much more difficult. So when it comes to the navigation, I think uh, the way it works is nowadays still uh, you measure water every year and then decide when to do to reach. Except I think they are getting better instrument or a measurement tool. So measurement tools is improved. So for example, even mud surface is very soft. And they, so if it's a soft mud, ship can go through, it's not a problem. If it's hard mud, ship a problem. So even people try to measure that kind of difference, density difference vertically. So this part, I think uh, this problem is, there's a numerical model, but the numerical model has too many coefficients and you have to carry it each time, it doesn't work all the time. So my hunch is uh, this one's uh, field measurement to the, at each side you have to measure. Then question is how to measure, in the old days you drop a red line and measure, but you have to measure the entire area. So you need something efficient. Oh, okay. uh, armoring process should, must be a big problem. We, we don't understand very well about that. Then also uh, settling velocity, flocculation process. Uh, yeah, that's so it's, it's you different. Order to, it's you different. order to solve this. So empirical for what happened is for mud transport, there's an empirical formula for mud settling. That has two empirical parameters and the mud depo, uh, erosion, another two parameters. And the net change is erosion and settling. And the settling coefficient may not be constant in each area. It may change yeah. each location. Dep depend on salinity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the scientists worked on this and made it more, more difficult and difficult. And then we said, no, I think uh, there are too many coefficients. So we said, we, the, uh, Professor Asis Mehta said, 50 parameters. Yeah, yeah, because I have only, my master has only one parameter. <laughs> no, the reason is, if you have to calibrate model at each side, you shouldn't have more than two, three parameters because then you can get any, uh, lots of different answer by different uh, calibration parameters. So, so I think uh, sometime, uh, Sometimes it's better to simplify rather than make it more complicated. All right. Thank you, Pak okay. Muslim. Thank you, Prof. Nobu. So I think uh, I will conclude since there's no question from the online. So there are several things. Useful field scale. I think he already made, he already uh, explained that about the. So to conclude what he has given us today, so the sediment transport discussion from Pamus and Pahmat, we know it is difficult. <laughs> Just like I said in our class, the error could be 100%, right, Nobu? And then the other thing is a lot of theory in textbook and manual does not always agree with the data. So we have to be really, really careful when we talk about this sediment in coastal area, especially. 
And there is one point here, uh, two points actually. The one is if we want to do uh, research that is good and relevant, then we need to attend those conferences, Pak Andoyo, Pak Muslim. And the second one is since we are an archipelagic, archipelagic country, that's uh, the talk of Pak Andoyo. Next talk. Then we have mm, long coastline. So Prof. Nobu suggests that we need to map our entire coastline using satellite. So we could analyze what method is best suitable for each of the location. Maybe we should do that. There is a one uh, job there, Pak Andoyo, Pak Muslim, Pak Ahmad. We can do that. And I think that's pretty much it. So it's difficult, Nobu, right? Prof. Nobu? <laughs> think it's a challenge. Right. It's good. It's good for the coastal engineering. That's very true. So it's an, still a lot of things to do. So if we are coastal engineer or ocean engineer, then there's still a lot of things we can do. Thank you so much, Prof. Nobu. One more time, round big applause for Prof. Nobu. Thank you. And our second speaker is Pak Dr. Andoyo Rianto. He is Professor Nobu student, just like me. So we have known Prof. Nobu for how long, Pak Andoyo? 30 some years, more, almost 40 years ago. So we were in Delaware, Pak Andoyo and I, under the supervision of Prof. Nobu. We are doing a lot of work. I think, especially Pak Andoyo, not me. Pak Andoyo, I think, is one of the best students of Prof. Nobu. Is that correct? No? Correct? Yes. Yes. He is one of the best. So Pak Andoyo will talk about the archipelagic side of our country, right? And then the title, and, and I'm gonna read his short CV here. So as we, I tell you that he got his, or he received his bachelor degree from ITB, civil engineering, and then he received his master's and his PhD from the Civil Ocean Engineering University of Delaware. We are kind of more proud if say we graduated from the Center of Coastal Applied Research University of Delaware instead of civil engineering. And he is also held a title IPU. That's um, I think in the main professional or the principal professional engineer. And he is a member of the Institution of Engineers of Indonesia, member of the Water Resources Engineering Indonesian Association of Hydraulic Engineers. And just like Nobu, Professor Nobu, Pandoyo, when he came back to Indonesia after he received his PhD degree, and then he started doing consulting a job or consulting project as a coastal engineer. So he's a consulting coastal engineer ever since he came back to Indonesia. And now he is actively still doing consulting engineering. Okay. Uh, what else can I say? That's it? Okay, that's enough. Pandoyo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pandoyo. Thank you, Madam Entin, for your moderating. Nobu, welcome to Indonesia, and I apologize, I just met you today. And we have uh, several gang members from Delaware today, <laughs> Pak Indra Jaya, Pak Paston. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Pak Indra Jaya from IBP and Pak Paston from Green. And Pak Muslim is our neighbor. Uh, Providence, Red Island. 
I always tell him that Rhode Island is smaller than Delaware, right? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, once I I went through Pa Pa Indra told me about Niagara Falls. Yeah. I went to Niagara Falls and in when I Rich Rust Island, I call him, and but we could not meet at the time. Muslim at the time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was Nobu's first PhD. So not the best, but for the first PhD for, for, from from him at the time. <laughs> okay, and then first PhD. Yes, and then. Uh, and then uh, followed my step to come to Delaware at the time, and, and then uh, continue working with Paston at the Civil Engineering Department as well. Okay, so uh, this is an event that we uh, we and then organized to welcome you. So. Uh, I usually put the poster in my uh, material. Again, welcome to Indonesia. And because Ibu Untin asked me the topic of my talk, then uh, she himself already put topic and trends. Yeah. So I would I would try to merge into that the title. And don't worry, I don't have uh, equations. My presentation is full with pictures. So just listen to my narration and you can identify a lot of the pictures in Indonesia. And uh, basically I'm a local engineer. So I know a lot about Indonesia and I put uh, my experience in this uh, compilation. Okay, uh, Ibu Devi help, help me. Okay, and go through Ibu Devi. And this is your poster, Nobu. Ibu Undin and Bu Iski, carefully, I think they prepared it for one week. <laughs> okay, and, this, and you have a lot of uh, program, and I will show you next, Bu Devi. Yeah, uh, next, I would like to show. Yeah, archipelagic, archipelagic nation. Only about 10 countries in, in the world. That means that we have more water than uh, land. So that uh, the whole boundary is considered as one entity. And that is archipelagic. And Indonesia is the largest archipelagic country in the world. Okay. And uh, from... Uh, east to west and north to south is about the same size of the United States of America, except Hawaii and uh, Alaska. So it is a big country. And uh, you are right, I will point out uh, later, Nobu, that uh, if we have no problems, then we have no job. Yeah, so <laughs> because we have lots of water and coastline, and so there are a lot of jobs. In, uh, Pak Muslim is always busy because he has a lot of jobs. Okay, in this our neighbors, uh, Philippines is also archipelagic, but uh, the others are not because they have on the lands. For example, Korea, uh, Korea, Pak pa Muslim has Samsung that he always proud of. <laughs> but it's not Korea is not archipelagic. Okay, next. Yeah, so I uh, trace your travel. Uh, you will go to Bali, go to Undin, uh, and uh, good choice, Jakarta, Bandung, and Bali. In Bali, uh, I think you will stay in South Bali or because the, okay, yeah, so that, that will be, and I took your photo from internet. Okay, next. Uh, I put the title perspective. That's from my perspective. And I'm here as an engineering faculty and I do both 
academician and engineer. Next, uh, Putefi. And uh, in ITP, we, the ocean engineering program is housed under the school. Yeah, faculty in English, I think is uh, the persons, yeah, but here it is school. Mm -hmm. So, but there is no S in, in, in front of it. So in Indonesia, we call it the Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering. But it was an historical accident that the ocean title never shows up in our uh, name of school. Uh, it's just it supposed to, to be Faculty of Civil Environmental and Ocean Engineering. But the ocean engineering was born very late. Uh, so we got no recognition in the in the name of our school. And we have now uh, I forgot how many schools in, in, in ITP. Okay. So here we are. Okay, next. And I would like to point out that in our study program, we have a academic part and the engineering part. Okay, next, Putefi. This is the visual of academic part. Lots of students, and yesterday, I think on Monday or yesterday, uh, you thought uh, summer, they call it summer, <laughs> tropical, tropical, because we don't have summer here, but uh, this is a uh, is Bonita here? This is the achievement of Bonita uh, doing it every year, inviting foreign students and local students to have uh, like one month, right? One month. Okay. So this is the visual visualization of the school part. We educate students here in our campus. And then the next one is I would like to visualize the professional part, the engineering part, with uh, this in Nobus presentation is revetment, not a seal, because it's revetment. And we, uh, in this case, uh, we have we have we use acropod. This is in South Java. Okay, next. So I see myself as both academician and engineer. And uh, these two function work para, and uh, it is how we balance the academic side and the engineering side. But we do both. The engineering practice will help our teaching in the campus so that our students learn also the realization of what we learn from textbook and class. Okay, next, Putevi. Now, this I mentioned earlier that uh, Nobu said that uh, we, when we have problem, when we have water, when we have coastline, then we have work to do. Okay, when we proudly say that engineering solve problem. Again, I show this map again to show that Indonesia has a fast oceans and I would call it endless shoreline. That is very long and uh, there are opportunities and problems both exist at the same time. Next, Putefi. In our um, law regarding water resources, we have three aspects of how to deal with nature. That is conservation, utilization and control and mitigation. And uh, I do not talk about conservation uh, because uh, it's not in it's not in the form of structure. But for number two and number three, I can visualize visualize it in the next uh, page. Pak Budevi, yeah. This is a structure, an infrastructure that is used to utilize the ocean. In this case, for the media for transportation. And we need lots, lots of uh, birthing structures like this. And in fact, I think Indonesia, officially we have like 1,200 
ports small and large uh, the commercial ports is about 200 something and the rest is a small uh, small birthing structure uh, scattered in the indonesian island okay and then the second visualization uh, this is a estuary of river Pocowonto. it's right it's right on the west side of the new yogyakarta international airport because the rivers in the south Java usually moves around so usually the standard uh, practice of our ministry of public works is to put a pair of groins and we call the pair as jetty this is in half uh, half constructed and then uh, the next picture this 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 has been fully constructed last year last year so now and it, it is in the name of protecting the Yogyakarta International Airport. The airport is so far away from Yogyakarta. And Pak Irsan told me it took how much hours, Pak Irsan, two hours from the airport to the city of Yogyakarta. If it is, if you are not caught in traffic jam, if there are traffic jam, probably the hours. And this is the structure. And this. We, I put this in the category of uh, the way we try to control some parts of the nature that uh, intersect with our lives. Okay, next. Mitigation. This is the, a picture of the Pak Muslim knows very well. It is uh, west, uh, called city of Padang in the west. Sumatra uh, province. Uh, from the point of view of coastal engineering, this is a very well protected beach because we have both revetment and growing. And because the city of Padang is important, we will not have a Padang food if there is no city of Padang. So uh, it is very well protected. I call it uh, excessive because we have both and groin. Uh, probably groin itself is not enough, but revetment should do the job, I think. But they have this uh, historically, so until Padang Pariaman, they will build structures like this along the coast. Okay, this is an example of mitigation that we do in dealing with the nature from the perspective of coastal engineering. Next, put that Okay, now I will focus on the one uh, topic that I promote whenever there are opportunities. That is regarding the land subsistence. Okay, first slide. Uh, many expatriates came to Indonesia and um, probably not much, not many from the US Nobu. <laughs> We probably Puntin should introduce Nubu to Ministry of Public Work because they come because our government officials invite them to come. Am I right, Pak Muslim? <laughs> we always say that we can do it you ourselves because coastal engineering, well, okay, the sediment transport in detail is very difficult, but how to deal with a problem in coastal is not that difficult, I would say like that. Because an academic point of view is different with engineering point of view. Uh, in engineering, we come, we see the problem, and we solve the problem. And it may be done without uh, all the details we need to know and measure. Okay, that's the way I, I see it, the more pragmatic. Uh, because half of me is engineer, the other half is a uh, teacher. Okay, uh, Teltaris has lots of uh, studies, whether funded or not, because uh, Teltaris is, uh, I think, is a private company. Uh, that 
do a lot of work in coastal engineering area all over the world, including in Indonesia. So they identify that along the north coast of Java, uh, there are uh, they call it risk index. And one that is very threatening to our North Java coast is land subsidence. I will show the pictures later on uh, in the next slides so that we can see the problem by visualization. Okay, I just use this uh, data to go through several places that is threatened by land subsidence. Okay, next. Jakarta is well situated. The city is big. Jakarta has lots of money. So Jakarta and the co-formal Indonesia can build everything, including, uh, including the giant civil for Muslim. <laughs> we always we always in quarrel about about the giant civil. And shown here is a civil, big civil in a uh, part of uh, Jakarta, uh, right to the east of port of Tanjung Priok. Uh, the seawall is big, and this is the, what we call it, the coastal seawall, not the giant seawall. Uh, regarding the coastal seawall, I think Pak Muslim and I agree. We both do not agree on the offshore seawall. Okay. Okay, this uh, visualization about Jakarta. So uh, I think the high speed rail is much more expensive because it's it costs about uh, more than one hundred what trillion in 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 English in English billion yeah billion billion rupiah and uh, to build this kind of dikes. For probably several trillion will do, yeah. Not not the not the coastal, uh, not the offshore structure. So Jakarta has the money to do it. Okay, next. Semarang, I put I put uh, that is the type one. Type one is the area that is affluent, so that you can build whatever protection that you need. Semarang is half. It must be protected, but the city itself is not that affluent compared to Jakarta. So they have borders and so on, but uh, probably once in two years or three years, the flood from the sea will come because the dike is not that good. It is not fully uh, enclosed, so they still have uh, problem with 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 uh, high level, uh, high elevation of water because the land is sinking and the sinking is continuous. Semarang is type two, uh, st is still a medium and large city, but it's not that rich as compared to Jakarta. Okay, next. Uh, Ministry of Public Work always say this, this is the part, uh, part that can protect the land against uh, high water and land subsidence. But actually, this is a very commercial project. Uh, they get money from the toll road. And the area that is protected is very limited because uh, you have only that uh, the length at the same as the length of the uh, toll road, and then you cannot protect before and after that. So it is also a partial uh, protection, same as the protection that we have in the city of Samara. I put that in type two. Type three is even poorer area. And I'm sorry for the student or probably my fellow that, that, that uh, came from Pekalongan. Pekalongan is type three. It has less money. 
and it shows in the form of the coastal protection that is built along the city. Not as good as in Jakarta, not as good as in Semarang. We have uh, coastal protection like this. And if uh, I would say that it will not last up to 10 years because the structure is not good enough as a, as a seaway. Okay, next. Jakarta itself is very long. Uh, it has about 32 kilometers of coastline and not all the coastline has been protected. Some is protected with a less uh, quality seawall like this. This is actually a uh, Seed, uh, concrete seed pile uh, only on top they make it uh, thicker and bigger so we have the impression that this is a wall but it is uh, just a, a seed pile in below so whenever the water rise up uh, they have seepage go through holes between the concrete seed piles and uh, so i would like to put this uh, the same as pekalongan because uh, the quality of the, of the seawall is not good. Okay, and then this is even worse because it is meant to be temporary. But temporary, you can call it six months. In less than two years, this is the picture from 2021. And then the next is two years later. Yeah. What happened? They put geopack exposed to the ultraviolet. That's why less than two years we have uh, things like this. And uh, if you go to Sunda Kelapa, it is still like this. Uh, but people have, uh, we call it the show must go on. So next picture, uh, Evi. Yeah, the Sunda Kelapa is a small, the small, ports of Jakarta, because the bigger one is the Tanjung Priok, Sunda Kelapa is uh, small, smaller, and, and uh, they have one section that is called Club One Rakyat, and it's, we still have a wooden ship like this, and they still have a lot of, 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 of this ship, and they do it not with a uh, People who do not know Sunda Kelapa usually think that they still have take the cargo by by person, but actually it's not the case. They already have a ship green, which is simpler, but no no more manual. What you call it in 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 English? Kuli, Pak Indra. What? Labor? Porter. <laughs> yeah, porter. Yeah. Porter in airport, uh, have, uh, they have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, what you call the, like a shopping grocery. Like but here, uh, we don't do it any longer. They already use uh, simpler crane. And with uh, protection like that, uh, the, li the, the life continues in Sunda Kelapa. And I would like to put it in type three because uh, as if that we, we, don't, uh, we don't have enough money to fund the coastal protection that we need. Okay, next. Type four is actually do nothing. You cannot do anything because, because the cost will be so high compared to the benefit that we can have. This Timbul Sloko is very, very well known because we have people still live in this area and they have uh, like what uh, port wall between the houses and then the, live con the, the life goes on here. And actually, nothing can be done 
because uh, the nature is so overwhelming. And this, I would like to, I usually, what are you going to say with green uh, fruits? You cannot protect coastal area from rising seas or land subsidence with vegetation. And I will have many pictures like this. This is for sure, I would like to say. You may protect coastal areas from the what? Uh, from abrasion, from coastal erosion, but not with uh, land subsidence. But they always have uh, events like that funded by government or by companies and so on. Uh, the next uh, picture is still about the same. And then if you come to this area one year later, probably the vegetation will vanish. Okay, next. This kind of pictures also well known. And if you type uh, sayung, tema, and so on, uh, they will show some successes in planting mangrove or coastal vegetation like this. But it does not solve the land subsidence. It only makes your coast greener. How much, I don't know, but this is not a success uh, to solve the problem at hand. You cannot protect a uh, village like Timbul Sloko by planting as many vegetation that you have. Okay, good evening. next. Now, uh, this is, I promote this uh, for the last probably five years, coastal reservoir. Okay, next. Uh, there are more stories about this, but I would like only to show because I have um, less than a half hour. Uh, the coastal reservoir approach in Indonesia, we have a story about that, uh, but again, I will choose only that is uh, reasonably can be done in the coast of near Jakarta not Jakarta, uh, because of some reason. So this is area west of Jakarta. We have uh, Cisadane River, with, will, which can feed fresh water in a large amount of water. And then uh, it will be stored in the coastal area that we propose. Okay, next. Uh, initially, we did not put attention to cable, uh, sea cables and pipeline. It turns out that the north coast of Java is full with offshore cable and pipeline. And if you want to build something on it, then you will have problem because first, if you deal with a big company like Pertamina, Pertamina is our national oil company, Pertamina will say, no, you, I will not move, and you have to move. And it has been proven with the case of Port of Cilamaya. Port of Cilamaya has been moved to Patimban. Uh, the big reason of it is that uh, there are pipelines of uh, Pertamina. So, we realized that in this area uh, offshore of the Sadani estuary, there are pipelines and uh, offshore cables. So we designed the coastal reservoir around that. Okay, next. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> not okay. So it's small one and it, it the coastal reservoir will function two folds. The first is we will have uh, 
like a giant sea wall, okay, to protect the subside land behind. Okay, so uh, the area that is protected will be free of uh, rising water when tide is high. And the second, we have reservoir. That's why it is called reservoir because we have we will have a freshwater reservoir on offshore. We don't have to buy lands, remove people from the land because we use the the, the area that previously is sea. There is nobody live there. Okay, and. Previously, this cannot be done because we do not have good sanitation on land. Like the city of Jakarta, uh, the storm water and the gray water goes to the same river. That's why the Netherlands concept, the previously Netherlands concept of seawall cannot be done because basically you store dirty water offshore. So we cannot utilize the water because it is still dirty. With the second generation of coastal reservoir, we will do the uh, water, what you call it, uh, uh, water treatment plant also offshore. That is uh, in this picture, it is the a quarter of a circle that's at the, the water treatment plant that is designed by our fellows in environmental study program. Okay, so this is a small, relatively small, but uh, according to our calculation, at least at the initial stage, it can fit uh, 35 cubic meters per second for the city of Jakarta and surrounding. So this is our proposal and uh, I don't have more detail about this. So the next pictures also all, all the public uh, is also is only pictures. And Nobu, we took uh, what we call it, we take a page from Tokyo because Tokyo has been successful in uh, forbidding its residents to take out the groundwater and of course they have to replace it with uh, adequate water supply from elsewhere and the elsewhere here in Indonesia and for the Cisadani coastal river uh, coastal reservoir will come from the coastal reservoir Jakarta is the blue line still that's the uh, graph for land subsidence. The elevation is still goes down uh, very steeply. In Tokyo, it has been solved 1970s. And we want to use the Tokyo experience for the, some of the north coast of Japan. Okay, next. Just pictures. This is a 3D impression. Uh, the components of a coastal reservoir. Once is untreated water, whatever coming from the river, in this case the Tisadani River, will be stored initially in the first uh, reservoir. And next, number two, will be treated with, uh, in this water treatment installation. And then to be stored as a relatively clean or we call it the raw water uh, in the treated water reservoir. Next, number four is coastal type system. Next, with gates, of course, so that we can control uh, the amount of water that is stored and uh, to be let go to the ocean. Next. Because we will displace many or some fishermen, then we have to provide 
replacement facilities for them. That's why in this Cisadani uh, Coastal Reservoir, we design a better facility for the fishermen. Okay, next. Number two, land development. This is to sell the newly reclaimed area to partially fund the cost of the coastal reservoir. Okay, I think, uh, and then we have a large uh, surface of water and we can use it for solar farm for what to call it, terbarukan, renewable energy. Okay. So I think I use only half hour, so I didn't. Thank you, Pak Andoyo. So we learn something here. Uh, the first one is since our country is archipelagic country, so, so we have a lot of challenges that we need to face as a coastal engineers. And since we are coastal en uh, ocean engineers or engineering, we have to solve our problems. That's true, right? That's our job. And one of the most uh, challenge for us is the land sub subsidence in, in Jakarta, especially in the North Java. So Pa Andoyo uh, proposed this um, coastal reservoir to solve two things. The first is, of course, to protect the land behind the, the reservoir because of the rising of the water. And the second one is the shortage of the fresh water. So this reservoir is expected to provide uh, the fresh water. And one thing that I take notice is that Pa Andoyo emphasized what Nobu has said in his talk that as an engineer, we not only the, the there are two parts that's important is the engineering part and then also the social part the social skill so we have to do that and then especially for this large project Pandrio show the type one type two type three so we need to pay attention to where the money goes my correct <laughs> all right we um now we open for questions any question from the students from paharman probably paharman behind any questions for Pak Andoyo, Pak Hendra, any question from the online audience? Yeah, can you show us? Okay. Oh, that's Pak Harman, uh, no boost model be used to field scale or prototype. Yeah, um, he mentioned about, I think the new idea, we need to think about it, Pak Ahmad, and maybe discuss more with Pak Nobu about that scale, scaling effect on, on that experiment. Nobu, uh, what he's doing in his experiment, he's not using that scale thing. So everything is the same. So we can directly uh, compare to the data. That's what I'm, I understand like that if I'm not mistaken. And then number two from Ramadani to Paandoyo. What is the parameter to make risk index of land subsidence? Is land subsidence happening on in Java Island or it happened in all part of the world? Are you going to answer one by one? Oh, that's only for one for Pandio. Okay. Yeah, Pak Ramadhani is a magister student, right? Yeah. Okay, I think I know him. Yeah, that's Teltares, uh, Teltares uh, thesis, meaning that I, I can share the report, but uh, I myself personally do not like to have an index like this because it is just, uh, it looks like a systematic way to decide something, but usually, government official would get lost in the system. So because the Indonesian government official likes to have tables, matrix, and so on, then Deltares 
the sign that uh, I, I will need to show this to the Indonesian government official so that I can that project from them. Uh, Pak Ramadhani, I will share the Delta Res report, but for me, just look at the physical condition and some of the location that I show, you can judge yourself. For example, Jakarta with a very densely populated and uh, because it is a capital and uh, it is justified to spend a lot of money to protect. But I also show you the Timbul Sloko. It's very, what you, you call it, uh, saddening to see the livelihood like that. You live in the water, but not really in the rumah panggung. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of our Indonesian fellows live in on the water, but they live on rumah panggung, elevated uh, houses that is designed and built like that. But in here, in Nimbus Loco, you are forced to live below the water, something like that. And uh, nothing can be done. I mean, that it is also not justified to spend money on making coastal protection to protect the village like this. Because if you calculate the number of people and so on, it will not be justified. So it's better to move them to the other place, give them new houses, enough land, and so on. So again, I cannot answer the risk parameter because uh, it's not my making. Uh, I will have different way to uh, scale what is justifiable to do something on it. Okay, I have only one question, so I have answered it. Directly, Bunden. Okay. Yeah, I got your points, pa Prof. Indra Jaya. Yeah, I note that IPP is now IPP University, Universitas IPP. Okay. Pa Indra, the first, the first question is about the structure of the dike. The dike must be impervious. And we have a dike like that in the world. In, of course, the Netherlands, in Korea. And to some degree, we have also impervious dike in fluid Jakarta itself. It is impervious. So we hold the seawater. It cannot enter. And then we have fresh water from Cisadani. We treat it to get a raw uh, water, but it is fresh, not 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 salty. 
Okay, and the second question, uh, if the government have its way, we will, of course, socialize this concept. And then we will argue about why do you put it on the water? Why not in the area between Bogor and Jakarta? But Pak Indra, you cannot find suitable land for that. Of course, we have success story about the displacement of people in Tuban and in Klaten. They have millions of rupiah to, to be displaced. But if we have, if we need what uh, big dam like Jati Luhur and so on, we will have problems. And uh, do you still remember the Ketungombo uh, at last for about 20 years or so on? But we can, it is uh, arguable. So whenever it will be implemented, then stakeholders will have their say, including what you think as it is more economical and probably other reason. Yes. And of course, uh, some parties will say, why not if you need the uh, fresh water, why not the salination? Because it is getting cheaper and cheaper. Yes, we have option in our hands. Uh, and because this kind of problem is not a sudden disaster, it is called a creeping yeah. because uh, you don't really have a disaster on Jakarta. Uh, sometimes the, for example, in Semarang, sometimes the dike uh, ruptured and then you have a problem. It will last probably one or two weeks. After that, everything goes fine. You will land subsides continuously, but uh, there is no like earthquake or so on. That's why the government also do not put enough attention because yeah, their term is only five years and hopefully it will go to the next uh, governor or the next president and so on. But I got you two points. Yeah, so the first is the structure. We already have samples in the world that is impervious and it can be done. The second is arguable. This may not the coastal reservoir may not be the best solution. We must test it. We must argue in public and so on. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Pak Handoyo. So there is one question from online audience. From the RISA NCICD, that the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development Project. The question is for you, Nobu. And this is that what is the effect of the sediment transport that has been uh, happening many, 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 many years through the condition of the soil? And if the soil is, if we are going to do the piling, how about the friction that will happen about the building of the soil itself because of the sediment transport in happening? Years and years. What's going to happen to the condition of the soil? Friction and how about the friction? That's the question. The sand is most of the sand is uh, sediment transport occurred on the surface of the few centuries. So even though it erodes surface. One centimeter sediment is sediment, it doesn't change. It's true that if you go further, further down, it's more compacted, but if you near the surface, it, it doesn't change. So it's not the geotechnical engineer. Geotechnical engineer in the deal is more like, a, more like one meter to one hundred meter. Coastal sediment, the deal is the surface, let's say 10 centimeters. And they suspended sediment, this uh, water gets uh, the one to one, ten meters. So, uh, unlike geotechnical engineering, so if sand is uh, deposited, then still surface layer is up there. 
But uh, if you go one meter down, then you have more compact. And the uh, question of Tokyo example, I, yeah, and I'm just saying about Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, but that something, whatever you do, it costs money. It costs money. The question is, what is the acceptable solution knowing how much it costs? Tokyo's case, they built the so evil, but at the gate, at the entrance, at the entrance, and also, but they told people to do not do groundwater, ground no pumping. So that's more, okay, when it comes to the engineering, simplest solution tend to be work or accepted. So, Government says no groundwater pumping in city. So under had the picture, and it seems like a lot of land subsidy occurring in Jakarta, and second largest is Sulawesi. Yes, what is the second largest city in Indonesia? Semarang. Semarang. Yeah, I think so. I think it's definitely related to the using groundwater. So that's why he, one option is pro, provide more pressure. Then maybe he can, he can compare. And another these things they did that they built a lot of sky, uh, the lots of sea walls, strong enough. But at the mouth of Diva, they built a gate so the sea water cannot come in during a storm. So there's a gate closed during a storm. The only problem is the one picture showed it four meter subsidence. Some part of Tokyo is below water level, below the sea level. So, same thing happened in New Orleans. New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. If actual flooding occurs, water do not escape after storm is over. So, you have to pump the water out. So I think uh, now in Japan, uh, disaster design storm is 500 years. I think 500 years storm occurs, nothing catastrophic occurs. So it's bottom line, you can, there are solutions, but it costs money. That's the reason that, uh, and then, and the show that the beginning, if, uh, Economically, each province is independent. Yeah, so, so that's why you said if it's uh, this uh, province has a lot of money, they can be more expensive. But if you don't have money, cheap option. The problem, cheap option, without without analyzing how cheap. In the, so I, I think it's it has to be more rational. I think. Uh, because otherwise, bottom line, you, know, you may spend uh, one here, one here, one here, then uh, over the 10 years, it may be 10, then maybe it's cheaper to spend from the beginning five, then reduce the risk. So nobody may have done this kind of calculation. I think. So I think, uh, I think the problem is final decision comes from politicians. Not the engineers. I think this is fairly international. I think so. Engineers has to be more smart dealing with politicians, so that uh, politicians listen to your opinions. I think because uh, politicians also worry about the next election. It's only maybe four years later. Engineers has to worry about uh, next uh, if one hundred years from next one hundred years. So this is different time scale. So it's the engineer's job to say it's better to follow the rational approach rather than follow the path of convenience now. So I think uh, you have a lot of job to do. So it's not engineers deal with the society. 
it's not enough to deal with the nature, <laughs> and the, but you have to deal with the society and the people. The, the emphasis of uh, uh, emphasis of the uh, people side, I think. Uh, I think we have time limit. I think it's up. So there is one question for you, Andoyo, but I think we can answer it directly. Probably, but Andoyo, we can answer it directly, not in this. Or, yeah, because we still have Pak Muslim uh, to deal. He will give a talk also. So I'm sorry for whoever question. We have the question. Also, I saw Jul Fixan. So probably we can have a special. Seminar for your talk, Andoyo. Right. Yeah, we will keep and answer the question directly. Okay. Directly. Okay. So time is eleven fifteen. So it's not. It's you now. It's time for our last but not least speaker, Pak Muslim Pak Doctor Muslim Muin. He is also a graduate from Civil Engineering ITB, nineteen eighty four. He got his master and PhD from the University of Rhode Island in ocean engineering. And now he is the head of our coastal engineering research group. Pandoyo mentioned before, he is also an advisor to the gover uh, former governor of Jakarta uh, for the accelerated development of the TGUPP. And Pak Muslim has been developing a set of software um, and apply it to everywhere in Indonesia, a lot of places in Indonesia and also in the world. So today he's going to give a talk about the development of his model and also where this model has been applied. Probably um, Pak Muslim, the floor is yours. We have maybe 25, 30 minutes and then. Thank you, Buntin. Uh, thank you, Professor Nobu. Uh, today, oh, thank you, Buntin, for generous introduction, especially for that photo 11 years ago when I was, I look younger. Okay, today I'm going to talk about three-dimensional, non-orthogonal, proof of linear, ocean hydrodynamic, and water quality model, um, description of tower and also the application in the nation. So I developed several software, uh, what I call it, Motum, Mokua 3D, Muchet 3D, which is uh, sediment and hydrodynamic model was a noble because uh, you know that cohesive sediment depend on salinity and settling velocity, also erosion, armoring, etc., and must be coupled with uh, hydrodynamic model. And I also have new drilling type in 3D, which is uh, needed for offshore industry. Go ahead, second slide. Okay, my agenda of presentation today is uh, history of 3D uh, non orthogonal coordinate models, which is my dissertation when I was a student in uh, Rhode Island 40 years ago, quite a long time ago. Uh, and uh, like, I'm not that, uh, yes, I do consulting service, but not that uh, active like Pando, yeah. But I do uh, consulting service using my, my own uh, software. So I'm going to talk about model features, uh, model development and testing, also model applications uh, about this software, Motum, then like Panda, you know, I also would like to, to uh, emphasize that the importance of 
relationship, academia, academia and industry. That is really important. And then talk about a little bit about Moto, Mokwa 3D, uh, milk drilling cutting, new shed 3D, and also tsunami. Uh, 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 Professor Nobu and Miyuhi 3D. And then conclusion. What what uh, need to be done in the futures? Yeah, recently I also developed uh, with Indus Current. Remember, Buntin was a supervisor of master degree students using this technique, and also uh, I developed further. Uh, Mokua 3D non conservative substance like dissolved oxygen, which is also important for Jakarta. Pando, uh, um, mentioned that the water quality in Jakarta is very poor. And the, to be honest, Indonesian fuel to separate sewer and drainage system. And very sad, no matter how hard you mention about it, you push it, it's very slow, very difficult. That, that is our problem. That's why I, um, I told uh, Dr. Dani Shumali Gaga when he is uh, chief of infrastructure in a new capital city, IKN. What you need to do is separate sewer and drainage. If you don't separate sewer and drainage, it will be a problem in the future. Go ahead. Go. So this, the model, the non-orthogonal, I said, get orthogonal profile linear, was based on my dissertation in University of Ireland and has been published in Journal Hydraulic Engineering, 1997. Now, why spherical coordinate? Of course, because Earth is, is spherical, not flat. And then why we need geographic information system? Because if you develop a software the output in numbers is annoying. We need to, to display it with uh, geographic information system. That's why we need GIS in, in our software. The software has been integrated to GIS system. So you can zoom, you can display the information system uh, in your map, and as such, uh, you can display uh, satellite image, a video, and so on. So now, why non-orthogonal models? Because it's so difficult to build or to create orthogonal grid system in complex area, especially Jakarta. It's a small river and so on. So we need non-orthogonal non model because we are facing non-orthogonal grid system. Go ahead. Next, please. Then the features of uh, this model, we use the semi-implicit time step, uh, semi-implicit technique, so the time step is large. Sometimes I use uh, half hour, 400 dynamic time step is very robust. I don't know next uh, model uh, and also it's not it's no longer limited by gravity waste. We can use sigma stretching for it's not uh, so deep difficult topography bathymetry and then we can use a z coordinate system for steep bathymetry area and unfortunately still one equation to boolean corrosion model and it has density induced currents right 
So it, it can run, it can be run in prognostic simulation if meant density and current are coupled is are solved at the same time. So this is also important if you keep the features of estuary system. Robust, uh, it's been proven for 70 years simulations. Can you believe it? That was expected in when I was uh, consultant for Freeport McMorrans and the software developed in Windows system. Next, please. Uh, the governing official. Next. Okay. This is uh, the idea of non orthogonal covalent. You have uh, the physical domain and above in the left pictures, right? And then you transform it to boundary plated system become uh, so it meets the coastline and so on, and you solve it in simple computational domain. It's, it is a simple finite difference actually. Next. So this is the basic equation in spherical operator because our our planet is uh, not. Uh, our planet is not flat, so it's spherical. So we need a spherical planet system to make it calculation easier and uh, more reliable. Next. So after we convert the physical equation in spherical coordinate to boundary fitted non orthogonal, the equation become messy. Mess. Is, but it's not difficult actually if you are if, if you focus how to solve this equation and had been solved uh, in my dissertation three dimensional this is in spirit uh, what is sigma stretching then next next so the of course the model need to be tested. So it, it has been tested for quadratic varying bathymetry. So the bathymetry is not flat and annular channels. And the, the result is, is good. Now, you can see in here for title. Next. And also to test the, the ability of the model to solve non, non orthogonal grid, we create non orthogonal grid system, as you can see in the left side in, in the reservoir. And the rest, the water depth in the reservoir is, is constant, it's flat. So we expect the water level is the same everywhere and increase like. That doesn't matter how non orthogonal uh, the grid is. Next, please. Uh, model applications. The application of model worldwide by Applied Science Association, Applied Science Associate Incorporation. Now, Become, I forgot, it's bought by another company but from England. And also uh, applied in many places in Australia, Gold Coast for uh, control flood in that area, Canada, Biofundi, Indonesia, of course, because uh, I developed the model, I applied in Mahakam Delta, Madura State, and many places. And make me busy for example, global. Uh, once you develop this uh, model, basic question hydrodynamic model, and then you 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 make it in uh, one system in software, it, it will be famous. Also in Vietnam and Gandre Bay. Next, please. So this is an application in Savannah River. So 
that was when we were uh, when we had uh, economic crisis in 96 or 97 i was invited to be a uh, visiting professor in URA again and uh, Malcolm Spalding uh, want me to apply this model in Savannah River. The impact of dredging canal when they increase the dredge canal and they want to see the salinity intrusion in Savannah River. And recently, when I take a look from website, they applied in New York Harbor and also in New Jersey. So it's a bit applied worldwide. And also in Australia, this is their measurement and from their report I, I obtained from a uh, website. You can find it. Next, please. So this is uh, what I call it, this software, new technology software. Uh, it has modem, which is uh, our spill model, Muset 3D, uh, sediment transport model, mod water quality, and drilling cutting. Now we will see it. Next, please. So this is uh, uh, the oil spill models. Uh, apply in when we had uh, oil spill in, in Balikpapan. It has trajectory phase model, stochastic. It means we want to take a look at the probability of infected area. And backtracking this unit. We can find the, uh, the probability of oil source. I said probability, not certain point. So because nature is uh, it's random process and also uh, the location is unknown. So it helps us to track where the oil come from, right? So the user of the software, most of oil company in Indonesia. So I'm, I'm happy about that. They both license. It helped uh, <laughs> our, our income panda here. I remember when I, uh, 40 years ago, Professor Nobu, uh, not so many people recognize our expert, our expertise, panda yeah? Remember that? So I, I worked together with panda many, many kind of projects. And Sometimes it's not even an ocean engineering related project, but we have to survive. So <laughs> finally, I remember that. So uh, until finally, we, we uh, industry uh, recognize our expertise and they bought this software and they're happy about it. And we, I'm also happy because I have um, another extra income rather than uh, minimum wages in Indonesia. So the the slide, uh, the picture below here is the application for Montara uh, blowout case, where uh, oil from Australia reach Indonesian coastline. But that is Indonesia when they face a problem with their neighbors, especially for uh, the neighbor is strong country like Australia, they don't talk much. <laughs> but I, I, I believe that that oil does uh, reach Indonesia and uh, Indonesia fishermen in uh, uh, NTT province uh, deserve for compensation. Until now, not even penny from Australia. But we see the impact. The seaweed is gone, the seaweed is power, sour, and they, be, they, are, they are no longer seaweed farmers. 
now they become the uh, jobless and very poor, very sad. What happened to uh, to people in Nusa Tenggara? Next slide. Yeah, I forgot to mention how accurate the the model is comparison between current uh, in Lalang uh, state is, is very nice. This is the example of uh, oil movement in Balikpapan case. You can see people, you know, question me why we all go to upstream. We have a river from upstream. The oil must be pushed outside. But you can see here, the oil go to upstream. Why? Because this area, a lot of mangrove. The tidal current from mangrove, a wet and dry area is very strong in this area. So if we had this kind of area, it's easy to clean the spill because when they go out and they go inside again and we had the opportunity to clean it up and of course unfortunately it will damage the mango system when i mentioned about this to government when you build a new capitals you must protect the mango system don't destroy it they don't listen to it. They, they said they, they care about mangrove that they don't. Recently, right, in our WhatsApp group in our faculty, FTSL, so they built a uh, house project in Patsy Lugo posting. They built uh, housing in in mangrove and they reclaim the mangrove. If they make if they destroy the mangrove, Paindra now it's buried and the dynamic. The dynamic system, strong dynamic system in and out of the current will be gone. And this if this dynamic system gone disappear, Paindra, what's going to happen? Poor water quality, sedimentation. Uh, please, Pak Indrajaya, you are professor. You, your voice will be heard. <laughs> uh, I, I remind the government about this a day. Um, next, please. So this is what we do for always oil company. We do model setup. Uh, and uh, the grid system, the battery metrics. So industry like it because what they need to do, just click click where the spill is, the duration, and the amount of the oil, type, typical of oil, and then that's it. If we give them where the oil will, be, will go and they, give them the information what, where we have to clean the, the spill. That's what I do in, for, for consulting service. Next. Mook walls. Mook wall is more water quality. So water quality could be conservative and non-conservative. And this one, simple non-conservative. But I, I do have another software for non-conservative. Uh, like for this of oxygen, where this of oxygen depend on uh, biological oxygen oxygen demand, right? But in dry and also depend on reaeration, depend on respiration, depend on sediment oxygen demand. Uh, this software will be released in shortly. Uh, next, uh, this is application in. Delta Mahakan. So you see the grid system is very complex. Next, please. Uh, this is drilling cutting. Drilling cutting, 
when our company uh, during exploration, they 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 might release the drilling cutting. Oh, uh, and we do this uh, simulation. Well, what is the impact of this drilling cutting to environmental? Next. Uh, this is tsunami with Pandoyo. <laughs> we wrote uh, a paper together in Alaska. So this is application of software in in Aceh tsunami. Recently we applied for a Krakatau. One can remember Krakatau case and had been sent to uh, Journal Coastal Research. Hopefully be published soon. Thanks. Eh. Also, I forgot to mention, for new tsunami, we also have sediment transfer. We include sediment transport model in hydrodynamic model. The, the, the difficult thing of a tsunami is wave generation. That is uh, difficult, but we need system as, as uh, early warning. So, Sometimes I think no need to to spend too much time on this wave generation because uh, hard to obtain this information how the seafloor uh, move and etc. Uh, it's not easy, but if we we have that information the tsunami generation uh, to, to calculate the propagation uh, is not that difficult. The run up for this software is based on Paandoyo ideas. That's why we published uh, about this model together, Paandoyo. Okay. Next. Uh, this is application of sediment transport model in a uh, Freeport. Freeport is probably the largest mining company. It, it, it released about 200,000 200, per day sediment from here onward. They call it mod ADA. And there is a strong mangrove like in IKN and New Capital City. This is strong mangrove system. So we had a uh, mangrove cell in calculation. And this is the comparison between the model about total suspended solid. You see, it's okay. It's not really matched, but you know, in terms of like, as mentioned by Bonte, if we talk about sediment, could be 100% error. But here is okay by Bonte, and also other dynamic thing. If we ignore the mangrove cell, it won't match the the observation. So the mangrove cell as a computer computational domain is really important in this case. And we had it both for cohesive and non-cohesive. For, for cohesive, we had as experiments how this uh, tailing settle uh, as a function of concentration and also salinity. So we had a laboratory work. But as mentioned by Professor Nobu, this cohesive sediment probably the future in coastal engineering research because it's very challenging. And I also found there is armoring effect. So my 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 work in this project is reviewed by Professor Asis Mehta. Probably Professor Nobu and fell asleep. <laughs> Uh, know about him. So he liked this idea. Next. Uh, this is 
uh, you can see how the salinity is separated for for its main roof system. This is uh, uh, very saline water. This is uh, fresh water separated by this in this main roof system and the interesting thing about this area the sediment concentration is higher at the surface than at the bottom it's very rare right if you uh, you know you do your in instinct you know that suspended solid must settle and when it settles, higher concentration at the bottom, but not in this area. In this area, sediment concentration is high at the surface. That's because density in this current. So density in this current pushes from ocean to, to upstream. Next. Uh, this is also another project to take a look the uh, dredging impact to pipeline. So the same thing happened in to me Pandoyo when when we told the the contractor you continue to this dredging it will make the pipeline. Uh, you will damage the, the, the pipeline because it will be uh, suspended pipeline. Because erosion, if you do dredging, you you take away the 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 position from before the uh, deposit in the pipeline. Then we had a problem along the pipeline. That's what what I found from the simulation. Next, uh, this mohead is just for power plant application. Next, and also used by Konjo, Premier Oil, and also Pertamina and Moratawa. Okay, that we had a conclusion, Bunten. So the three had three dimensional ocean hydronic model using non orthogonal spherical coordinate had been developed. We don't depend, I don't depend on uh, commercial software or software uh, from above. It's collaboration between academia and industry are extremely important for this country. Without the support, we are nothing. So all oil company has used this uh, Motum software and most drilling activity in Asia use modeling, new drilling cutting 3D. It's nice. It's good for me. Study, learn ocean hydrodynamic from US and come back and develop, develop our own software. This, this is very nice, you know. And sediment, moshet, it's also been used uh, in, in several projects. Mokuo, New 3D also uh, has been applied in Asia. Now we develop a new software for this of oxygen and also for wave induced current. Uh, that we, it will be published soon, Buntin, <laughs> because the supervisor of uh, of students under Buntin and uh, Bonita. Thank you for your attention. Impressive model, especially for the trend, trend, transfer sediment. We see the result is like very, very good. I think I think compared to other model, probably I don't know. I hope I hope uh, it's uh, like Nobu said that there's a lot of 
parameters or something has been kind of not accounted in this model or the model available model. Hopefully, but Muslim model is the one who include everything and works well. So we learn also that behind this development of the model, there is a Peter Swift story uh, from Pak Muslim and Pak Andoyo in the early days in ocean engineering program. Okay, and because of the time, I think we only can have one question. So I invite one question from the audience here. Oh, okay, from a student. Good. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Momo, for the interesting presentation. Uh, I'm Donna, and I want to ask about the oil spill modeling. Uh, the oil uh, has different density with seawater, and it happened on mangrove area. And how do you model the oil? And also, how do you model the mangrove? Do you uh, assume that the mangrove has a solid structure or a cylinder? Thank you. So uh, your question is how I handle the mangrove system. Uh, so we need to know what is the mangrove. The, the mangrove uh, elevation uh, is normally in mean sea levels, right? And then when we have rising tide above mean sea level and the water go to the mangrove system. Just like that simple. Just you have this area, you, you, you can calculate how much the water will go in from that door, right? Yeah, you, you do that. Simple, wet, and dry area is even though simple is powerful. You cannot neglect that. And during when when the waters come in, bring sediment, right? It will settle. You calculate it. the settling velocity and etc. And now for my mangrove system, I assume there is no erosion in the mangrove because uh, it's difficult, right? It's easy to for sediment to settle, but difficult to erode because it's very, very uh, weak current. The, the water current is low. It won't erode the sediment in from the mangrove system. So you, from that project, they like it. So uh, how is the sedimentation rate in the mangrove? Will it, will it destroy the mangrove tree or not? That's the question from Prelpat. And I said, in this mangrove system, it will destroy. This system is okay. And it will change uh, the type of tree and so on. I right. hope I answer your question. All right. It's very challenging. And hope, but unfortunately, not so many uh, students interested to to write the code. <laughs> that's that's true, but I'm a Muslim. So I think the question is, how do you uh, treat the mangrove system in your model? So yeah. your answer is, you just assume that in the mangrove system there is no erosion. All the sediment who comes there will settle. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Is that correct? Wet, okay. wet and dry area, just like. Just like we had in this room, right. it, uh, the level is mean sea levels, and we had uh, when the the sea level, uh, sea uh, rising tide, it will enter this this room. Right? It's easy to calculate how how much the water divided by time, etc. That, all right, all right. So this, 
this assumption of what we how we treat the the mangrove but of course we see that mangrove is not just if, if we are, we do it in the in the experiment it's just like piling things but in actual condition the the roots itself is yes. different from yeah. one species yes. to the other species so yeah. Yeah. with the hydronomics it's already difficult how yeah. to handle those things and imagine the sedimentation you, you, you must assume the you have to assume if something. you don't information of about the mangrove you must assume the uh, the topographic or the level of the mangrove that is because to conduct topographic survey in mangrove is, is dangerous and also uh, difficult and the mangrove system is assumed flat the same elevation all right, so there is a lot of things still to so, be done, Donna. So don't worry, you become the ocean engineering, also coastal engineer, engineer, sediment problem. There's still a lot because we so yeah. Now we just uh, assume the simple thing, and then we just um, compare it to data and things like that. But still a lot to be done. I think. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Pak Muslim. You're welcome, Bonten. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Pak Doyo. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Big round of applause to our three speakers. And thank you also, Pak Shawal coming in, Pak Paston and Pak Indra, and also all the...